Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. Thanks for joining me for a conversation about a fabulous book called The Good American, The Epic Life of Robert Gersoni. Uh, it's written by Robert Kaplan. I'm here with Robert Kaplan and we have a panel to discuss the book. Uh, I think it's one of the most interesting books I've ever read uh, and it's gonna be a classic. It's gonna have enduring interest 20 or 30 years from now, this book is still gonna be read. In 1958, a Cold War novel, The Ugly American, painted an unflattering portrait of the U.S. diplomatic corps. The book was a giant bestseller and had a powerful impact on the future structure of the America's Foreign Service and coined a term to describe Americans whenever they showed up around the world. Bob Gersoni, a consultant for the State Department and the subject of Robert D. Kaplan's new book, personifies a direct rebuttal to the failures portrayed in The Ugly American. And I think perhaps that's why it's called The Good American, the, Robert Kaplan's book. Kaplan's The Good American, The Epic Life of Bob Gersoni, the US government's greatest humanitarian, is one of the best accounts examining American humanitarian pursuits over the last 50 years. In 1976, Gersoni began a 40 year career as a consultant for U the US Agency for International Development and the State Department, taking on 54 assignments to some of the hardest postings in conflict ridden regions in the world. He implemented innovative and novel techniques for interviewing refugees, the internally displaced, and other vulnerable people in highly dangerous and remote settings. This approach set Gersoni apart from many researchers who relied less on ordinary people than on officials somewhat removed from the realities on the ground. Over his career, he interviewed more than 8,200 people for one to three hours each. These interviews created a bottom-up granular data on conditions in some of the hottest spots through the Cold War years and later. Gersoni became known for the thorough three to 10 hour briefings he delivered in Washington. His data-driven meticulous findings were often controversial, controversial but impossible to refute. And they regularly resulted in action by policymakers aid agencies and non-governmental organizations. Gersoni's information overturned foreign and security policy that had previously been developed from Washington without much field information. The, um, today, we're gonna have a conversation with Robert Kaplan to, to get at this, and then we'll have a, a conversation with panelists who worked with Bob Gersoni over their careers. So let me turn to Robert Kaplan, the author of this book. Robert, thanks for being with us today. I always ask people when they write a book, why did you write The Good American, The Epic Life of Robert Gersoni? Why did you write this book? Well, um, Dan, it was because Bob Gersoni is sort of the greatest humanitarian you've never heard of. Um, uh, you know, it was, you know, the, one of the points of the book is to say that here is an absolutely extraordinary life, but, at, but outside of the subcult, the professional subculture with which he operated, nobody has ever heard of him. And it was, so it was to bring this to light. Um, but I wrote the book, it's an interesting story actually. I had been running into Bob in Sudan and other places for 35 years. And I knew what he was doing, but it never clicked in my mind. You know, he was just going out, living with refugees, coming back to hotels where I would encounter him in the developing world. Um, but a few years ago, we had dinner together and I just casually asked him where he went to school. And he, because I assumed he had gone to Harvard or Yale or someplace. And he said, well, actually, I never went to college. You know, and, th and that stunned me, you know, doing work for the State Department and USAID for decades, you know, never went to college. And then he mentioned, well, I never graduated high school either, you know. And then it turned out that he was a, a son of Holocaust refugees, that he had worked in the commodity trade. Um, and, uh, and, and he had served in Vietnam um, and, and, you know, was awarded a bronze star there. And I said, 
this is a very unusual life story. You know, it has parts to it that don't normally go together in one person. And that was the real impetus for doing the book. And then of course, I had to interview many dozens and scores of other people to verify it, to find out details. And the story kept growing rather than diminishing. It's, it's a fascinating read. I love the book. Uh, when did you first meet Bob Gersoni? 1985 in, in, in April in Khartoum, Sudan at the Acropole Hotel. Uh, there were uh, many journalists and humanitarian relief workers congregating there because this was the time of the great Ethiopian famine of the mid 1980s where you had hundreds of thousands of Ethiopian refugees fl uh, flow across the border into Sudan and into refugee camps. And it was, and, 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 and this was a famine that engulfed, you know, what I'd call greater Ethiopia, you know, parts of Sudan and other places. And Bob was there interviewing re uh, refugees and someone introduced, uh, introduced me to him. It's, in, it's all in the book. And, uh, and that's when we started our, our friendship. So you've run into him in other places though over the years, you first met him in Sudan, but there were probably a half dozen other places. Describe some of the other places you bumped up to, into we, him we along just the way. Kept a poor, we just kept missing each other, you know, in, in various places in Nepal and Liberia, um, uh, it, you know, in, in other such places. And whenever he would come back from a major assignment, he would call me and talk to me about it. But again, I didn't, I di it didn't click in my mind that, that this was a book until I found out more of his, about, about his life story. Uh, the way I define him, Dan, is for, you know, he's sort of like a character, a very introspective, um, you know, obsessive character out of a Saul Bellow novel, but who operates in settings best defined by Joseph Conrad. Uh, in other words, in other words, his personality doesn't go with the, with the part of being a, some swashbuckling journalist or a leaf worker. That's not Bob at all. And so, could you talk about his method? I mean, I think one of the things that has struck me. I, so in this book, which I, as I said, I've loved reading again, the book is called The Good American, The Epic Life of Bob Gersoni, the US government's greatest humanitarian by Robert Kaplan. Bob, it, it struck me as I, I knew half the people in this book. Some of these were my bosses. Half these people were my bosses and all people I like and admire in AID and the State Department, all fabulous people. They all, I, and I, bumped into Bob Gersoni once. I've since met him in the last several months and really enjoyed having breakfast with him at the McLean Family Restaurant. But there's a specific methodology to his, could you talk about what is sure. this? Yeah. And how would the you describe is, this? Yeah, you see, Bob is unusual in an, on another level. He's very much a, an accountant slash commodity trader slash math slash conservative brain in, in, in you know, it, you know, immersed. small C conservative. Yes, yeah, small C conservative, non ideological, you know, just, you know, like someone out of like, um, out of the business school, so to speak, um, uh, you know, immersed in this setting of idealistic, liberal arts-minded humanitarian relief workers. And what he did is he put his math brain to work with relief. In other words, he loved agronomists, you know, because he was in the commodity trade, he could talk with peasant farmers about prices and crops and crop control. And, and, and all of that. And he understood that, you know, that, that humanitarian relief was also a small business opportunity in this sense, in the, in the sense of, you know, not giving handouts to people, but making, but allowing them to earn their own livings, and, you know, and setting up relief projects that would allow them to work on their own and make a profit and have some human dignity. Um, so that, you know, his work in the commodity trade after he dropped out of high school was critical to like the next 50 years of his life um, because, that he, you know, he consciously applied that to his field work in Africa, in Central America, in other places. So 
just a, a couple of things. Uh, one of the things that, so we all know people who either didn't finish high school or didn't go to college and have had very successful careers. And he's an example of this. So one of the messages is you don't have to go to college to have a really successful, meaningful career in the United States. Is that a fair point, Bob? Um, it's a fair point, but just be aware that we live in an age of credentialism where it's real, you know, especially in our fields, it's hard to get or impossible to get anywhere without a, a graduate degree from a top school or something. This was somewhat less of the case when Bob broke into USAID work. Uh, you know, he broke into USAID work in 1976 in Guatemala, right after a major earthquake. And the, the head of USAID in Guatemala, a man named Fred Shea. A former here. boss of mine and yeah. a friend of mine. He was a character in the book who I did long interviews with. He discovered Bob in Guatemala and took him on board, even though Bob was a high school dropout, because he watched to see how Bob worked, how he developed strategies and solutions for earthquake affected uh, peasant farmers in the Guatemalan highlands. Um, so I'm not saying that this cannot happen today, but it's less likely to happen today that that's, someone that's with, fair. With, without a high school degree would even get that opportunity. But, and but, but Bob, let's how did how did Bob Grissoni end up in Guatemala and what was he doing there? Um, he got out of Vietnam uh, the year before and was and was, you know, taking courses at at uh, um, at. Um, uh, I, at Long Island University in, in New York, and a teacher had to make a field trip to Guatemala. And he went along with the teacher and he got enraptured with the country. This was 1970. And he wound up staying for six years, learning fluent Spanish, setting up a language school, or rather a system of language schools that taught not only Spanish, but native Mayan languages to Mayans themselves so they could translate their own works, so to speak. And then he got, he drifted, he didn't drift, you know, he kept up the language school but then he, he spread out into humanitarian relief and then came, fate intervened, the Guatemalan earthquake of 1976, where he went to work full time in humanitarian relief because he was on the ground for several years already. He knew the country, he knew the language. And at that point, AID felt that they needed him. You know, they had spotted him and they needed him. And that was the real career break that he got. So, Bob, I've been to Antigua, Guatemala, and it's a flourishing, fabulous tourism center. My, my colleague, Margarita Seminario, who's the deputy director of the Americas program, took me there in another life, in another context. I'm on the board of IFAS, which is the free and fair elections folks, and she used to run the Americas program in IFAS. That's the first time I've been to Antigua. I think that's how it's pronounced. Really beautiful colonial town. Blow your socks off. Is it fair to say that Bob Gersoni helped kind of launch a renaissance of Antigua, Guatemala, Antigua? Yeah, it is fair to say. And that was that was told to me by people in Antigua, you know, who Antigua, I went down yeah. to interview. And they said it was Bob's language schools, you know, which started the renaissance of the whole place. And to this day, Though Guatemala, of course, is a very troubled country. We read about in the news more and more in connection with migrants. Uh, Antigua is a real flourishing, safe uh, place where it has just the right amount and level of tourists. You know, it's not overrun by mass tourism. It's very high quality boutique sort of tourists with guest houses and places like that. And, you know, and several people who, you know, had told me that, you know, Bob's language school had started this whole process. All right. So talk a little bit about the method and what was unique about Bob Gersoni's method. Well, it was the thoroughness, taking thoroughness to the nth degree, so to speak. He would, you know, he, you know what he would do is he would um, never ask people their names, but would ask everything about them, their tribe, their, 
dialect, how many children they had, where they lived, what exactly had happened to them if these were, you know, in, in war, this was often in war-torn situations like Mozambique or post-genocide Rwanda or places like that. And he would um, spend hours listening to them, you know, and recording their, um, uh, re you know, recording their conversations in his notebook. Um, and, and, and then, do, so it was hours with each person and then it was interviewing hundreds of people about the same thing, essentially, in the same area, all in isolation. And as, and as he put it, if you interview enough people for enough hours over, over a period of time, and you're very organized in the way that you put together the correlations of the discrepancies between one interviewee and another interviewee, you're liable to wind up at the practical truth of the matter. All um, right, so would you describe him as sort of a humanitarian human intelligence gatherer? Well, you know, if you think of intelligence in its, um, you know, in its original sense of the word, stripped of the CIA and all these connotations, but what intelligence means is, is disciplined analysis, you know, gathering up facts and, and in a very disciplined analytical way, you know, at coldly analyzing these facts. Uh, Bob was, a good, you know, has been an intelligence gatherer. Uh, you know, and, but, you know, restricted to the, to the subject matter of finding out what happened to individual people in wars and in conflict. So talk about, there are a couple of chapters you dedicate to certain case studies, if you will, that sort of, he, where he overturned accepted policy. Maybe, I, I'm wondering, I'm also, I'll come back to this, but could we still do this today? I mean, I think there's sort of a, you know, this was a before, you know, there was like lower levels of satellite photos or electronic levels of information yeah. gathering or big data. Um, talk about the case of Mozambique and talk about the case of North Korea. Yeah. Well, Mozambique is, you know, it was Bob's most famous. It's what made, made Bob famous within the subculture so to speak. Uh, the Mozambique Civil War, by an order of magnitude of refugees created, of uh, people killed, was, was several times larger than, just for comparison, the Balkans in the 1990s. And Bob, more than anyone, stopped that war in its track. Um, and what he, because what he did was he interviewed hundreds of refugees in Mozambique, and uh, and came away with 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 an, with with a with the truth that nobody in Washington wanted to believe and did believe, which is that the Renamo, the anti-communist Renamo guerrillas, that Washington was all geared up to make part of the Reagan doctrine and get a lot of military aid to prolong the Mozambican civil war, were in fact a bunch of murderers. They were like the Khmer Rouge of Southern Africa. They were nowhere near like the Ang. Golan uh, Unita rebels headed by jo Jonas Savimbi on the other side of Southern Africa in Angola. So that, um, uh, uh, you know, so Bob came back with this truth, um, you know, and, and this is what he did often. He came back to Washington with an uncomfortable truth, essentially. And remember, this is all the days before email, before Twitter. Uh, when satellite photos were much more cruder than they are now. So, you know, you could probably say that 30% of what Bob Gersoni found out in all these countries is today capturable by Twitter, by satellite photos, things like that. But the other 70%, I would argue, still is not, because you don't really know what's going on in a place till you send people to the place itself to talk to people. I, I, I agree with that. I agree with that. Talk about North Korea. Yeah, uh, Bob spent about, I think it was two months traveling along the North Korean Chinese border, uh, on the Chinese side of the border, obviously, but in, a, but in an area that was flooded with North Korean intelligence agents. And he went along the border for two months, I believe, and interviewed did interviews with, I think, 97 people. Uh, uh, um, 
and uh, each for several hours. And this was 2002. Now, this was before Barbara Demick's great book called Nothing to Envy about daily life in North Korea, which didn't come out until I think 2007 or 2009. But, you know, her book is, you know, it popularized what life was like for daily North Koreans. Bob was there for like, you know, half a decade before her and essentially created a picture of daily life for, uh, uh, for North Koreans uh, for, the, uh, you know, for the Washington bureaucracy, for the upper levels of the bureaucracy that simply wasn't known about before. You know, it was the first time there was a picture of what it's like to be a North Korean and not just in Pyongyang, the capital, but in a small village or a town. And it in was- living hell, by the way. So, so he, but what struck me about the case study in your book is doing those 97 interviews was damn dangerous that there was Chinese intelligence, North Korean intelligence. It's, a, it's kind of a quasi porous border. It's kind of a gray zone, no, no man's land for lack yeah. of a better term. There were, he had to leave he got some kind of an inkling that they were gonna um, bring him in for questioning and he had to leave at like two in the morning under cover of darkness and was sort of like one step ahead of, of, the, of somebody bad. Yes, um, Reb Bob did the North Korea assignment officially working for a Christian charity because he wanted no links with the US government there. Um, so the, essentially AID arranged for Bob to go to work for a Christian charity to do this. And a number of coincidences kept happening. People kept asking for him at the hotel reception desk that he didn't know. And these people appeared just to ask him questions and he got paranoid, you know, he, which is understandable. This is after weeks of being alone, just interviewing people in another language through a translator. And he got very paranoid and he decided it was time to leave. You know, so, so an yeah. escape was arranged or an exfiltration was arranged. So why don't you describe a little bit more Bob Gersoni? This is not Indiana Jones. This is not, he's not, um, he, he's sort of, a, you know, he's a, a, a great, a great deeds doer with a, with, in my mind, sort of with a, with a, what do you call those things that, you know, uh, you know, a note taking device of some kind, right? I mean, but describe him a little bit more. Yes. Um, Bob is, you know, he's nobody with a flak jacket, you know, you know, as I said, he's not a swashbuckling out of the movies, foreign correspondent or relief worker. He's very nervous, obsessive, compulsive, uh, uh, you know, always afraid he's going to fail at his next assignment. Um, you know, extremely sensitive. Um, he doesn't. He 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 doesn't drink caffeine. Not only doesn't he drink alcohol, he can't. He doesn't drink caffeine. He has such a sensitive stomach. You know, he eats one meal a day. And actually, this was perfect for how he spent his life because people, you know, spend their, you know, spend lots of time in the developing world where often where there is no, no alcohol available, no fine food. No, not, it's oftentimes not coffee. It's and a lot of Bob, tea. For Bob Gersoni, this was perfect because this is how he lived anyway, you know? So to have one meal a day or two meals a day and not to have fine tea or coffee and no alcohol, well, that, that was normal life for him, even back home in Virginia. So he, in a certain, in a, in a very inverted way, he, you know, he, he, he psychologically suffered less than others. There was less deprivation for him. Are you guys going to do a movie out of this book? This is a, this, he's the kind of person you could make a film about with the right kind of character actor. Yeah. If, if only, you know, we're still waiting, you know, we've had a, uh, we've had a few, um, uh, we've had some limited interest, but nothing has congealed so far. All right. So here's my last question for you. What's the message for the present and the future for this book? I think the message is that the bureaucracy has to be amenable, has to be willing to test out individuals who come back to Washington with inconvenient truths. Um, and, 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 to, and to respect field work, 
because in the in this internet driven social media age there's this assumption of knowledge where none actually exists there's this easy assumption oh we know what's going on in tigray or we know what's going on you know in this place or that place when in fact we may know much less than what's going on unless we send some someone or some people there to actually talk to people on the ground like a respect for area expertise even though that bob was a generalist his whole life, really. Uh, but a respect for expertise on the ground and allowing it to percolate up through the policy circles. Great. Okay, Bob, thanks a lot. I'm going to turn now to my friends uh, who are on the panel. I'm really grateful to have my friend, Ambassador Ann Patterson, former USAID Administrator Brian Atwood, and Ambassador uh, Peter Galbraith. Thank you, all three of you, for helping me and helping us uh, do this event. So let me start with my friend, Ambassador Patterson. Ambassador Patterson, when did you first meet Bob Gersoni, and how did, how, did his, how, did you, how did you interact with his work? Well, he came to Columbia when I was ambassador there in the fall of 2011. And he was recommended by my AID director, Ken Ellis, um, who was one of the, like many in the book, one of the great AID professionals of the, of the last 50 years. And Ken knew there were problems with the alternative development crop substitution program where you were trying to get peasants to give up growing coca and get them into legitimate crops. So he asked Bob to come down, travel to Putumayo, at this point, Colombia was the kidnapping capital of the world, 3,600 kidnappings a year, an uncounted number of what were called drive-by kidnappings. So Bob went down there, he talked to farmers, and, and uh, he came back and he basically said, the program's not working. Uh, not only is it not working, it it's, has the potential and it is sort of a national embarrassment. Uh, and he briefed this in Washington, and it was extremely valuable because, one, he's an outsider, and it's very difficult for people in the bureaucracy to, it's enormously helpful to bring in somebody, the book is full of AID directors who did this, but it allows you to make an adjustments in the project uh, before you make really catastrophic mistakes. So that's, that's where I met him. Excellent. Okay, and tell me about the, what, what did you think about his technique? He's got sort of an unusual, did you have to sit through one of his lectures or presentations? Yeah, that was great. And I want to talk a little about the interviewing technique. There are two things that really stood out. And one, one was he interviewed people one-on-one. -on -one. And people who haven't been in government probably think, so what? That's pretty typical. It's not typical. People who interview people in refugee camps and other places we tend to travel in packs now. And I'll never forget going with the late ambassador, Richard Holbrook to a refugee camp in, in Pakistan and realized we had a 15 car convoy. So the ability to get the truth in a situation like that where you don't spend enough time on the ground is extremely limited. And the other thing, Bob had the capacity to articulate what he saw in a way that people could understand. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, covered with cosmic think and big ideas. It was just the facts, ma'am. And, and so it was enormously persuasive because it was essentially devoid of emotion and, and theory. Administrator Atwood, great to see you. Thanks for doing this. When did you first meet Bob Gersoni and how did you interact with his work? Well, I think the first time we met was uh, he came back from Nicaragua uh, on the Atlantic coast, uh, looking at a very troubled part of Nicaragua. He asked if he could come in and brief me and uh, wanted at least two hours. And I think we agreed that uh, I'd come in on a Saturday, which I often did anyway, but uh, we spent probably four or five hours uh, going over that and some of his ideas, which were very pragmatic, as Anne was saying earlier. Uh, he really understood people. Um, there was one line in, in Bob Kaplan's great book, which I think uh, captures Bob Gersoni better than any other. He believed in the infinite wisdom of the common person. And uh, he really did. He really was able, I mean, I think the problem here, and, and I, later, of course, the big issues that we worked with were, were Rwanda. Uh, the problem often uh, with both USAID and the State Department is that we work in capitals. Uh, 
And it's difficult, even with the security situations that we face today, to get out into the countryside and really talk to people and find out what's going on. In the case of Rwanda, for example, um, after the genocide, which was shocking to everyone around the world, but certainly to us in Washington, we wanted to believe that the new government was going to be different, and we wanted to embrace that government. Even more importantly, as time went on and the camps in the Goma area uh, were more and more troublesome because it was clear that the Interhamway people were there and were, uh, were taking over those camps. Uh, I worked very closely with Mrs. Ogata, the UN Commissioner for Refugees. And uh, there was a real push on the part of policymakers in Washington to reintegrate those people, to send the Hutus back to, to Rwanda. So I sent Bob out there to find out what was really going on. And he came back with what was really troublesome to a lot of people in Washington, which is that the government itself was uh, committing its own genocide, mini genocide maybe, but still 30,000 people, uh, they estimated, Bob estimated, had been killed by the RPF, the military uh, of Kagamis. Uh, Bob was troubled by that because uh, he knew that he was going against the grain, just as he had in Mozambique, and you mentioned this earlier. He was going against the grain. We brought people together that stayed in AID and had him brief for hours on end and eventually convinced people, and in particular, convinced the United Nations and uh, Mrs. Ogata and others that it was premature to send people back into Rwanda. So once again, he went against the policy grain, and it's not, it shouldn't be blamed on anyone. Uh, if you're operating in a capital and you want to have good relations with a government in power, sometimes you don't want <laughs> to find out that they're not exactly what you hoped they would be. And Bob performed that role. And I think Peter Galbraith can speak more to this as well, but the Bosnia issue as well, he went against the grain as, uh, there as well. The conditionality that was attached to the Dayton Accords basically uh, meant that uh, we should use our money only to try to reintegrate the, the ethnic groups of Bosnia, the Croats and the Muslims and the Serbs. And uh, he found it was impossible to do. We would have started the war all over again. That was not easy for people to accept. And uh, we had to figure out how we worked with that word conditionality. Uh, and Bob found the way, uh, basically knew that uh, shelter was the most important part of getting that country stabilized so that maybe one day there would be more integration of those ethnic groups. Ambassador Galbraith, thanks for being here. How did you first meet Bob Gersoni and how did you interact with his work? Well, uh, Bob Gersoni uh, was covering Bosnia. Uh, I was ambassador to Croatia in 95 and, and 96. Uh, but I want to bring another character in Robert Kaplan's wonderful book, uh, which is Tim Knight, uh, who worked with Gersoni, uh, but who ran the dark team uh, for Bosnia, Croatia, uh, from Zagreb, uh, and whose work during the war, not afterwards, but during the war was so critical. And, and one of the things that is so wonderful about Robert Kaplan's book is it gives credit where credit is due. Uh, and I cite a particular case which changed things in Sarajevo. I, Robert Kaplan cites it, but uh, almost immediately after I arrived in Zagreb as the ambassador, uh, Tim Knight appeared with a cable describing the absolutely dire humanitarian situation in the, in, in the city. What had happened is that uh, the Serbs had cut off the water and uh, they cut off the gas. And that meant that people in apartment buildings had to go down and collect water from puddles or from the river, but it was highly polluted. With, with, with the gas, they could have boiled it. But uh, with the gas cut off, they couldn't boil the water. And Tim came up and, and described this in, in, in detail uh, in, in the cable. Uh, and he had told me a, a story, a, 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 a joke that was circulating in Sarajevo, uh, which said, what's the difference between Sarajevo and Auschwitz? Uh, uh, the answer is, at least in Auschwitz, they had gas. 
uh, and uh, I think he wanted it in the cable and with some misgivings, I included it. The, the result is that that cable that Tim Knight did went all the way to President Clinton who was in Tokyo and uh, it, he, he took action, uh, basically delivered an ultimatum to the Serbs and the gas was turned on. Uh, it, it, to some degree, the cable got me into some trouble because the question uh, immediately was posed. The cable was leaked to the Washington Post, not by me. Uh, perhaps Tim Knight had some role in it, but it was sent unclassified. And so the question came back to me, why did you send an unclassified cable? Well, the answer was that Tim Knight worked in an unclassified space. But, you know, again, what was really important in, 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 in Robert Kaplan's book is that he's, he's showing how the system really works. It isn't all done by ambassadors or presidents. Uh, it, it is people like uh, Bob Gersoni and Tim Knight who can make such a huge difference. So let me ask the three of you in terms of, do we still need people like Bob Gersoni in our system? Let me start with you, Ambassador Patterson. Well, absolutely. And I can, I can give many examples because you still need to know what's going on on the ground. Uh, and, and frankly, this has gotten a lot harder in the State Department. Uh, and after Benghazi, it's gotten, it's gotten even more difficult because people aren't willing to take risk. I mean, the Foreign Service and AID are full of people who believe in the techniques of Bob Gersoni, that you have to go talk to foreigners in a foreign language to find out what's going on. And, and I have an example from Yemen. We had two Foreign Service officers in Yemen who spoke good Arabic, who'd lived there before, and they never ever left the embassy because of security constraints. So yes, we're, uh, there are many places that I could cite in the Middle East where we really didn't know what was going on because, so, because we couldn't get out there and find out with the techniques that Bob Gersoni utilized so effectively. Administrator Atwood, do we still need folks like Bob Gersoni today? Absolutely. And uh, one of the things that I tried to do way back when in the 90s was to get our aid missions to get out into the field and do a lot of what Bob Gersoni does, but it's not so easy. And it's become increasingly difficult to get uh, diplomatic personnel into the field because it's so dangerous and you've got in each embassy nowadays a regional security officer that says you can't do this and you can't do that. Uh, the one benefit that USAID missions have is they've got a lot of very talented Foreign Service national employees and I think it's more likely that they can get out. They certainly have a, a good way of understanding what's going on in their own country. <clears throat> but you really have to get to the granular side of what people are thinking, especially if you're if you roll, <clears throat> let's leave aside the foreign policy role and look at the development role. You really have to understand what people need, what they want, and what makes their life better. And the only way to get at that, it seems to me, is to use the kind of methodology that Bob has used. Uh, I've even recommended to the current leadership of USAID that that someone study Bob's methodology, that they actually have a, a course on it for young uh, foreign service officers. Uh, the question- I 100% um, agree with that. I 100% yeah, agree yeah. with that. That's a great idea. That's a great yeah, idea. And, uh, again, though, they have to deal with the security issues. Uh, someone like Bob, and he, uh, Bob Kaplan has really done a tremendous service here in, in writing this book for not only for Bob Gersoni, who's become a hero, but for a lot of the career people uh, that have worked with him uh, over the years as well. But uh, the, the real issue today is uh, whether you can, you can operate uh, in very dangerous countries uh, and, uh, and survive, frankly. Um, that, that's what we really need to understand a lot better. And our policies will, will reflect it uh, if we in fact get that kind of information. Ambassador Galbraith, do we still need folks like Bob Gersoni today? Yes, but I want to come to a point that both uh, Anne and Brian have made, which is we also need to think about the security conditions. Uh, when I was ambassador to Croatia, you know, I could sign off on people going to Bosnia uh, and doing the kind of work that, uh, uh, well, that Tim Knight did and, and others did. And that was absolutely key to making progress. We got 
hundreds of prisoners released because we had people who could go into uh, the prison camps that the Croats were running. And, and that in turn led to the um, end of the Croat Muslim war, which was the first step toward Dayton. More recent, I, I travel a lot to Iraqi Kurdistan. One point I met with the, uh, uh, a diplomat who had been in, in charge of the Suleimania governorate, who, but she was based in Erbil. After a year, she had never been there. And this it was in a place that is very safe, uh, uh, but you know the, they had Iraq-wide rules. Uh, and so, and, and, the, and the point is that most foreign service officers want to go out. They are willing to take risks. You know, we take risks with our military. Frankly, uh, we ought to be taking the, you know, the same risks with our diplomats. We have to accept that from time to time, something is going, may happen. And of course, we'll do everything to avoid it. But uh, if, if you don't see a place, you can't understand it. Uh, and, and for me, I uh, sort of another episode that illustrates this, uh, the kind of analysis that came from Washington about the, what was happening in Croatia in 95, particularly whether the Croatians, Croat army could, could deal with the rebel Serbs in the Ukraine, you know, that, that analysis, which came also from the CIA, was that it would take, uh, you know, the Croats couldn't overwhelm the Serbs, the, 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 uh, the, the conflict with last month, so it'd be guerrilla resistance. I went back and forth. Uh, uh, between Zagreb and the rebel Serb capital of Kanin, I could see there was no, there was nothing there in Kanin, no defense, and the Croatians took it in four days. Again, it is the experience of going someplace, seeing it, talking to people. Otherwise, you simply can't understand the situation. Okay, so what is the message uh, for the present and the future of diplomacy and development. Let me start with you, Ambassador Patterson. What's the message of this book and what's the message of Bob Gersoni's work? What, what lesson should we take from this? That, that, that what matters enormously is to know what's happening on the ground. And, and, and one of the issues is of course we become, we become uh, well, first of all, for, for a number of years, we didn't really have to be that good. We just had to be there. We were the hyperpower. And countries basically had to do what we said they had to do. Uh, and now that's really changed dramatically because the Chinese have more diplomatic uh, uh, installations than we do. So we have, to, we have to up our game and we have to be willing to take risk and get out there because we make mistakes. And, and the other problem is behind these fortress embassies, we look afraid. And, and that has consequences too, I think. Uh, so, so that's the message you need. You need not only Bob Gersoni, who's unique, but you need lots of younger Bob Gersonis that you can train up who at least won't be like him, but can use the same techniques and that we can take a higher degree of risk to get them out in the field. Administrator Atwood, what is the message for the present and the future of this book and Bob Gersoni's work? Well, we live in an age of social media, which uh, has influenced policy in strange ways. We live in an age when, even though we're uh, perhaps a slightly diminished superpower, we're still a superpower. So when we go to a capital city in a, another country, people want to influence what we think. There's a story in Bob Kaplan's book about Mozambique, where uh, a certain individual that Bob Gersoni initially interviewed was trying basically to tell him that Renamo was a wonderful uh, organization. Um, you, if you don't get out into the country, if you don't talk to real people, you're not really going to know. Uh, I was always a little frustrated when I was at AID. <clears throat> we made a, a deal with the CIA that they would never use an AID person for cover or whatever, so that's not the point. But the intelligence agencies weren't covering Africa other than to follow in the old days, they were following the Soviets around Africa. <laughs> Whatever they w did, we were, we were looking into it. But they weren't looking at the conditions on the ground that could change the pol politics of a country. They weren't looking at the issues <clears throat> in places like Zimbabwe or whatever that were really major earthquake faults in the po pol political economy of that country that could have caused a collapse. I remember Vice President Gore asking for a study about the, the issues that were most likely, that correlated most to state failure. And we got an interesting study, but it was the agency across the river that went to universities to get the information for that study. 
But we can get that kind of information if we have a whole cadre of Bob Cressonis out there in the field. It's dangerous and that's the problem, but we need to do it, it seems to me. We can't make the same mistakes that we made when we were a superpower and could get away with those mistakes. Ambassador Galbraith, what's the message for the present and the future of Bob Gersoni and his work? Well, again, I would uh, uh, second uh, what both Ann Patterson and, and Brian Atwood have said, which is uh, you need people who are going to be risk takers, who are going to go out and um, see the situation firsthand. Uh, you know, I, uh, Brian talked about the um, in, in intelligence agencies. Uh, you know, the, you, yes, uh, uh, what you can collect uh, electronically uh, uh, from uh, human sources, uh, you know, spies, that sort of thing is helpful, but a huge amount of the information they get comes from liaison relationships with host country intelligence services. And they have a huge spin on it, which isn't always right. And yet we, because it's intelligence, perhaps because we pay so much money for intelligence, the uh, policymaking establishment tends to rely on that more heavily than it should. Uh, and so you get uh, something like, something like uh, somebody like Bob Grissoni or Tim Knight, uh, who can you know, present a memo in the case of Gersoni, uh, uh, the memo I think on, he gave to George Schultz uh, on Mozambique that Schultz showed Ray, uh, Reagan and that was derailed the whole effort to uh, support Renamo. It is that kind of, of, of work that is so essential that needs to be encouraged. Uh, and, and that's what we need to do. Can, we need to have that in the, in the future, but again, we, we can't do it with the kind of fortress uh, mentality that we have in exactly the places where we need to get out. All right, let me give you each sort of a minute for sort of a parting thought. Let me start with you, Ambassador Patterson, then, uh, and then I'm gonna give the last word to Bob Kaplan. Let me start with you, Ambassador Patterson, just sort of a parting thought on this book and the work of Bob Gersoni. Well, I think the, the, the parting thought is that, that Bob Gersoni is unique and, and I certainly compliment Mr. Kaplan for writing this book and, and his many other insightful books. Uh, as well, but but the, that we need more people, as we've been saying all along, we need more people like Bob or Sony, because it's important to this to the national security of the United States. It's not it's not just to to, but it does serve to improve programs, to improve human rights. But it's fundamentally important to our national security to get this right. And that's why we need people like Bob Gersoni. And across all these many years and these many, uh, many, uh, many places in the world. And the other thing that came across from the book really is, is AID and State Department and all these heroes, as Peter said, that are that are out there trying to do the best, but they do it indirectly in some respects through somebody like Bob Gersoni, who they can call in. And there are not very many people like that left anymore. Thank you. Good, okay. Uh, Administrator Atwood. I just wanna thank Bob Kaplan for, for doing this uh, work. I mean, I understand why uh, he was attracted to someone like Bob Crusoni, but he did the really difficult work of getting at the details and putting it out, but more importantly, not only does he honor Bob Grissoni for his work, he honors a lot of the career people that are out there that are risking their lives. I often found that there was a disconnect between the, the way we honor our military and the way we honor our civilian uh, diplomats and development professionals. We really need to do a better job of that. I mean, there at, at USAID and in the State Department, there are walls where people have died in the service of their country. And they're taking risks. They're taking, in some cases, uh, other than in a hot war, they're taking even more risks than the military does when they're not at war. So we need to honor them. And I think Bob Kaplan's book does that. It honors not only Bob Grissoni, but the career foreign service. And thank you, Bob. Great. Ambassador Galbraith. Once again, I agree with what uh, Anne and Brian have said. But that said, I, uh, Barb Gersoni is a very special person, but he's not unique. Uh, uh, there are other people. I, I mentioned Tim Knight, I, there, who uh, was working for AID, but also 
there were foreign service officers in the 90s who uh, I sent into uh, Bosnia. At, at one point, the front line literally crossed over their, their heads. Uh, no, I, I never sent anybody who wasn't willing, who didn't want to go. Uh, but it, and that is exactly that we have those people and, and it, it saves lives. It, 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 that work actually made possible the Muslim Croat agreement that, that ended the, uh, the Washington agreement, then ended the Muslim Croat war that set the stage for Dayton. Uh, so it, it, this is a, a very important. I also want to um, stress the point that Brian just made about uh, 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 you know, honoring the, the diplomats and uh, other uh, civilians who, who take risks. Um, you know, in, in Zagreb, uh, in the immediate period uh, uh, after Dayton, the military was there. They weren't allowed to go out and accept in groups of 10 in, in, in Zagreb. Whereas you know, our diplomats went around freely and went, went across into uh, uh, adjacent parts of Bosnia. So uh, you know, we do have, or we did have in the 90s, uh, uh, people who, who wanted to take risks, did take risks and did very valuable work and, and we cannot operate the way we do today. Okay, Robert Kaplan, I'm gonna give you the last word. Well, um, I, what I would say, something we haven't discussed so far, which I, you know, which emerged through my research of the book, is how realism and idealism need not to be opposed to each other. Uh, Bob Gersoni was an idealist, but he always put his arguments in Washington in terms of the national interest. And as it happened for chronological reasons, the high points of Bob Gersoni's career are, occurred in the State Department under George Shultz. And I was not looking for this, but the more research I did, the more I learned what an extraordinary Secretary of State George Shultz was. Um, and because George Shultz, it was a matter of character, of Shakespearean character. He was a cold warrior. He took hard lines against the Soviets, um, but he also fostered the Helsinki process, uh, which led to the end of the Cold War eventually after, after, the, after the Reagan administration. And he took a deep interest in the human rights uh, problems of Uganda, Mozambique, with Sudan and Western Chad. He was involved in this. So in his own person, he sort of synthesized realism and idealism. Um, and, and it was because Bob Gersoni was able to make his arguments in terms of what was good for the national interest that he had a lot of influence in Washington. You know, I mean, look at this. Here's an independent contractor, often for a non-line bureau, no less, humanitarian affairs or, or whatever, a USAID. And yet he gets in to see assistant secretaries of state, under secretaries of state, occasionally the secretary of state. The CIA wants to be briefed by him. The NSC wants to be briefed by him. Why would, why was he granted so much access? Because he spoke their language. You know, he said, here's what we should do, which is both the right thing to do, and it's, and it's in the self-interest of the United States. That the two that you know, that realism without a dose of idealism is not realistic at all. And you know, and you know, and that's something we should bring to the table because it, you know, the Cold War is now over, and a lot of divisions have occurred in among the foreign policy elite um, that didn't exist before. You have realists who have kind of morphed into neo isolationism on one hand, and you know, and then you have you know, a, a, you know, a, a, you know, people on the left for whom human rights has become almost an ideology divorced from U.S. national interest. Bob Gersoni, you know, typified a center. You know, a center between these. When realism meant internationalism, it meant engagement in international affairs under Schultz, Baker, Kissinger, and others. But particularly under Schultz, you know, you know, yeah, he was able to combine these two aspects. And Bob Gersoni ultimately would not have been able to do a lot of the things he did without the support of George Schultz. Well, look, this has been great. The conversation has been about The Good American, The Epic Life of Bob Gersoni, the U.S. government's greatest humanitarian by Robert D. Kaplan. I want to thank 
Robert Kaplan. I want to thank my panelists, colleagues for uh, doing this today. This has been great. Thanks to all of you. Our program has now ended. Thank you very much.